Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome. My name is Klaus Weinmate. I'm the uh, engineer and chief observer for the uh, Big Bear Solar Observatory. Our director, Sasha Kosovichev, was unable to be here today, so he's asked me to uh, stand in for him. So uh, please put up with me for the, uh, for the short duration. Uh, one thing he definitely wanted me to comment on and to let you know about is um, our friends of the Big Bear Observatory organization. Big Bear BBSO is uh, quite committed to trying to increase our presence here in the Big Bear community. Um, that, uh, that's evidenced by our uh, our partnership here at the um, Discovery Center, the projects we're doing with the local schools, uh, this very visible lecture series, and um, this new fledgling organization. Uh, this is an idea to increase um, our interaction with the, uh, with the local public. Uh, if you join, I know you get a, uh, a BBSO calendar. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about the, uh, the friends of the BBSO, you should speak with uh, Erica in the back of the room. Now this is the uh, second talk in the BBSO public lecture series. Uh, today we're very pleased to have um, our own John Varsic speaking to us on the history of the BSO, the Big Bear Solar Observatory, if I get this correct. John received his uh, PhD at the University of Hawaii, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, John, um, uh, since then for the past 26 years he's been working in the field of uh, solar astronomy, both here with the uh, Big Bear Solar Observatory and at the National Solar Observatory in uh, Sacramento Peak, New Mexico. John certainly wears many hats here at, uh, at our observatory. He's responsible for our information technologies. He, uh, he personally developed much of the telescope control software for the facility. He uh, writes the observatory's daily solar activity forecast. And in his spare time, he's known to operate the telescopes as well. Uh, John has seen several generations of instrumentation and personnel come through the observatory here. Uh, there's really no one more qualified to talk about the observatory from a historical perspective. Please welcome Dr. John Varsic. Well, thank you, Claude. Um, I wanted to say, you know, when you're in Big Bear, you can go to the Historical Society and you hear all sorts of interesting talks about all sorts of strange things like grizzly bears and dams and fox farms and all sorts of odd things, but usually you don't hear much about solar observatories. And it's kind of a shame because uh, we're very fortunate here in Big Bear. We have this facility, which is one of the major solar observatories in the world. And um, really pleasant if more people uh, were aware of what we're doing and for what this place can do for uh, the study of our nearest star. I'm going to be spending most of my time today not talking about solar astronomy or about the sun in particular, but about solar telescopes and solar instrumentation and why we ended up here in Big Bear. Big Bear Solar Observatory was dedicated in 1970, but the story goes back quite a bit further than that. Um, it was originally founded by Caltech, California Institute of Technology. It's now operated by NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. We're now operating what we'll think of as the highest resolution solar telescope in the world, which we call NST. Uh, but the story goes back further than that. The sun is a typical star, and, and the reason why we're interested in it, basically, is that the sun is, is the, more or less the Rosetta Stone of astrophysics. The sun allows us to get a good close-up view of the surface of an actual star. Um, other stars are, are up hundreds of thousands of times further away at minimum. Um, but by looking at the sun, we can understand in great detail what's happening on the surface of a fairly ordinary star. 
Solar activity also affects our technology and our lives in various ways. But here again, that's not really the subject of this talk. Um, briefly, though, we, there are some uh, details about the structure of the sun that are of some importance. Basically, when we're on the, when we're looking at the from the surface of the ground, the surface of the Earth, we're able to study um, the lower levels of the solar atmosphere pretty well. The uh, the photosphere, the normally visible surface, the area of the temperature minimum, the top of the photosphere, bottom of the, of the chromosphere, the next layer up. What we don't get a good view of from the ground in general is the corona. The corona can only be seen from the ground under very limited circumstances, either during rare solar eclipses um, or from very few high altitude sites, higher than Big Bear, uh, that can operate instruments called chronographs. But what we are able to do is we can measure the magnetic fields on the sun, which can tell us a great deal about solar activity, about how sunspots form, how solar flares form, and how these active regions develop on the sun. And people have been doing this sort of work for quite some time. Now, Galileo was the first person to observe the sun with a telescope back in 1609. Um, and he was using a very primitive telescope and some slightly dangerous techniques. But it wasn't long after that before um, much better techniques were developed. This is a drawing of a telescope from about 1630. And um, it shows a technique of observing the sun, which is not very different from, a, from, from what a lot of people, a lot of amateur astronomers do today. Uh, you have a small telescope up here. It's mounted on this stick. And it's set up to project an image of the sun onto this easel back here. And it even is mounted on this mount here, which allows it to track the sun with one motion. And it's the same kind of mount we use today. Um, and in fact, you know, many astronomers still observe the sun in the same way. For example, this is a, a drawing from probably the best place for solar uh, drawings in the world, uh, which is the Mount Wilson Observatory, from a couple days ago. And you can see all the sunspots that were on the disk at that time. Now at Mount Wilson, they also have a setup feeding a, a, a spectrograph, which allows them actually to measure visually the magnetic fields of the sunspot memory, which is what a lot of these numbers are in there next to the sunspots. So, going back again, the sun gives us an active changing, changing star we can get a good look at. And what happened roughly 150 years ago, starting 150 years ago, was that um, this technique called spectroscopy began to be developed. What spectroscopy allows us to do is split the light of the sun, or of stars, up into a spectrum of, of the, uh, the rainbow. And if you split it up wide, far enough, wide enough, what you'll notice, is, what you find is that the individual colors um, can be associated, many of them can be associated with emission or absorption from individual atoms that are in the surface of the sun or the star that you're looking at. And this uh, technique is what allows us to understand what the sun and stars are made of and and how they work. Um, but this technique, because it spreads out the light so much, um, it began to be a problem. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't photograph it very well because it, was, it made things faint, even with the sun. And so around 100 years ago, it began to be realized it was important to have large telescopes that were specially built to look at the sun. And the first person really to do this on a regular basis was a fellow named George Hale, who was a, a great solar observer and telescope maker. And he's associated, in fact, with the establishment of, a, of many observatories in the United States, including Yerkes Observatory, <coughs> which, is operate, which is owned by the University of Chicago and is in Wisconsin. And then when he realized that um, the observing conditions in Wisconsin weren't all that wonderful. Um, came out to California <coughs> and um, found that things were much better out here. 
and he went on to establish two great observatories <coughs> Sorry, um, for observing not only the sun, but also nighttime objects, and these are Mount Wilson and Palomar. And he was also instrumental in making the California Institute of Technology the great institution that it is. Okay. So, <coughs> starting in, in 1904, so 110 years ago, he began to build a thank you. He began to build a series of solar telescopes at Mount Wilson. The first, the first one he built was the known as the Snow Telescope, and it's this this thing here. And it has a flat mirror out here that directs the sunlight into a horizontal telescope and into a spectrograph further back. What he found when he did that was that uh, the great nemesis of all solar astronomers, which is that the sun is hot. It heats up the ground. It heats up the ground. The air above the ground begins to convect, and it distorts the images. This is what the astronomers call bad seeing. <laughs> the sun's very good at this. And so in general, most places, daytime seeing is much worse than seeing at night. So Hale began to think of, well, what can we do to defeat this problem? And in fact, trying to deal with or defeat this problem has been one of the great themes of, of solar telescopes for the last hundred years. And what Hale did was he took a small telescope and started climbing around in trees on Mount Wilson. And what he found is that it seemed like the scene was better if he climbed up further in the tree. So what he said, okay, let's build a telescope on a tower. So this is what he tried to do next. He built this, this thing out here. This is the, called the 60-foot tower telescope. And it consists of this tower with some flat mirrors in the top and a telescope lens in the top that focuses the light down into an observing room down at ground level. The idea was you could get the telescope above the ground and avoid some of the problems with the sun heating the ground. And it sort of worked. And so I thought, well, all our tower. So we built a 150-foot tower. Here's this thing in the back, and you can see there's a better picture of it here. And uh, these tower telescopes <laughs> did work up to a point in reducing the effects of the solar ground heating. However, even, um, even at that point, the solar ground heating would eventually warm up the ground, and after a couple hours or so in the morning, uh, the conditions on Mount Wilson are usually not very good. Uh, it's not a bad thing to say about Wilson, Conditions almost everywhere when you observe the sun after it's been up for a couple hours aren't very good. Um, these telescopes, the 60-foot tower and the 100 and the 150-foot tower, are still in use today, although I'm not sure for how much longer. Well, and of course, Mount Wilson was operated and Palomar were operated by Caltech, and Caltech had a big solar astronomy uh, department. By the 1960s, the active nature of the sun, the, active, the evolution of what we call active regions, the sunspot areas, and the production of solar flares was under intensive study. Part of this had to do with the advent of the space program. Um, the space program allowed us to put satellites in orbit that were actually measuring um, the solar wind and other emissions from the sun. And in order to understand where these things are coming from, we needed to have a better idea of how active regions evolved over time. And so the advent of the narrow band, band filters, which had in, been invented back in the 30s, and stop motion cameras allowed the study of these rapidly changing solar features. But there was a big catch. You couldn't do it very well from Mount Wilson because after a couple hours in the morning, the scene got bad and you couldn't see anything. So <clears throat> the Caltech Solar Group decided, well, let's try to build a new observatory that we will carefully select a site that has the best possible conditions. And so they decided, okay, we will conduct a great survey of places all over Southern California um, to find the best spot. Now, back in the 1950s, meanwhile, in Germany, uh, Karl Kiepenheuer, who was 
at the Fraunhofer Institute, was, what was then the Fraunhofer Institute in Freiburg, um, which was kind of the German big solar astronomy institute, still is, um, advocated placing solar telescopes near water. The idea was that the water has a high heat capacity, it reduces the amount of convection in the air above the water, so the images should be more stable. And Kiepenheuer and his group built a telescope on the island of Capri, off the coast of Italy, and, um, and found uh, that it did work up to a point. And so the Caltech group decided that, okay, we will add some lake and ocean sites to the survey just to check this idea out. So they had some criteria for the selection of their new observatory. It had to be within 125 miles or so of Pasadena so they could get to it. Okay? And it had to be someplace that was reasonably accessible because they didn't want to have to spend all the money to build a road. Okay? And they had to they'd be able to buy land so they could uh, build the place. And they wanted a place that had long periods of good seeing so they could make their time-lapse movies. And other factors that they included in their selection was they wanted to also the site to be have good transparency, which means that it's free of haze and smog and dust and so forth. These are things that don't necessarily distort the image, but reduce the contrast. And they also wanted a place that was reasonably clear, didn't have a lot of cloud, low clouds and fog. Um, so they started off with starting with an eight-inch reflecting telescope that they put in the back of a truck and went around to a number of different locations. And they started with 34 sites and 100 locations, uh, slightly different locations at those different sites um, around Southern California. And this was taking place in 1966 and 1970. Finally, they did some observations using a portable narrowband solar telescope, um, which we call the Carroll Spar, and they finally did those final observations at Big Bear Lake Elsinore. This is what the Carroll Spar telescope looks like. Um, we had this telescope at Big Bear for many years after the, after the um, survey was completed. Um, as I understand it right now, it's, it's kind of in storage at Mount Wilson. <coughs> I think that's the last place it was at. And um, it could still be put back into service. But anyway, so these are the locations that were picked. Big variety of sites everywhere from Catalina, uh, Gaviota, and Santa Barbara, Montpinos, Palomar, Big Bear, Caltech Campus, um, and then all these other places. Elsinore is over here. And so what did they find? These are some of the results from that survey. Okay, and let me show you what these are. These are the scene values rated from 0 to 10, local time. Or you have the Barbara, Caltech Campus, Big Bear, so forth. What you find is that typically the spirit, like Elsinore, the scene will peak kind of in the morning, and then it, um, what you notice about Big Bear is that it stays reasonably good all day. And the same was more or less true of Lake Elsinore. And so what they ended up doing is they, and they, they finally narrowed it down to choosing between Lake, Lake Elsinore and Big Bear. And the scene was better, as you can see from that chart, from their survey at Lake Elsinore. But Lake Elsinore is, you know, it's, it's relatively low altitude. And they get a lot of low clouds and fog there. Okay. Um, and which we don't get here. And so that's what led to the choice of the Big Bear site. Um, now, it's, it's interesting to note that most of the site survey observations for Big Bear were actually taken at a place called Moon Camp, which is just west of the observatory heading towards Swanskin. In fact, as I understand it, right now there's some kind of project to build something there, but at the moment, right now, it's, it's still empty. But um, Caltech was able to buy the land just east of there at the observatory site. Um, what they found is that once the observatory was built, in fact, what they found is that the, the seeing, the stability of the air out on the lake was even much better than what they had found at the shoreline. Remember that the site survey data were actually taken at the shoreline, not out on the middle of the lake where the observatory is. So the survey was primarily uh, 
put into motion by Robert Layton, who was um, one of the main people at the Caltech uh, Astronomy Department. Um, and he hired a fellow named Hal Zirin, um, who came to Caltech in 1965, and Layton put him in charge of building the observatory. And the onshore land was bought by Caltech, and the observatory site was leased from Bear Valley Mutual, which is the Peak Lake Bottom. And so in 1968, they began construction at the observatory site. And what you'll notice, a couple things right away you'll notice about this. One thing, the lake was very low. Okay, the lake was very low. Yeah, you know, I have to remember in those days, the lake was being run by Bear Valley Mutual, and it was running run for irrigation. And like in down in Redlands, and so very often the lake was drawn down quite a bit in order to water the orange groves, and so this was not unusual at the time. And what you notice is that there's this slightly higher point out here, and they built up this this road which goes out there. Now, in fact, what you're seeing here is not the causeway that's there now. It's quite a bit lower than the causeway that's there now. Um, and so later on, in 1968, they began building the observatory buildings, which you can see. And then there came the winter. And the winter of 1968 was an extremely wet winter. Um, and it was, it was one of the wettest winters that we've ever had here. And they had like 25 inches of rain. Now that's rain, mind you. Um, so what happened? The lake filled up. And well, fortunately, the observatory building was built to handle that. Um, and what you'll notice is that there's this, this area here. Um, this is actually the floor below the ground level that's there now. And so the lake wasn't quite full. Um, and this area here is the, is the entrance where you normally go into the building now. You also notice that the dome wasn't there. They had a, a plywood roof on top of the building. Here it is in early 69. Now, interesting thing that it's uh, you'll see that they're starting to put the dome on. And see that the, the lake water level is close to the top, and that there's this little dome here. This is, the, this is where the final site survey measurements were taken. And the foundation for this dome is still out there at the observatory. It's hidden under a giant willow tree, um, but it's still out there. Now, when the observatory was finished in 1970, um, we have the first set of telescopes. There have been three sets of telescopes in the dome over the years. And this is the, this is the inventory of the first set of telescopes. Okay? And, and there was a large tube in the dome, and inside the large tube were two 10-inch refractors and a 16-inch reflecting telescope to feed the spectrograph. And a rather odd instrument for the time, a nine-inch reflecting coronagraph. Now, a coronagraph, again, is an instrument for trying to observe the solar corona from the ground. And um, normally, coronagraphs are found at higher altitude sites than Big Bear. And there's a good reason for that, which is that at higher altitudes than Big Bear in general, you have less scattered light, and you can actually see the corona. Um, but Zirin was not afraid to try new things. And not only was he trying to use a coronagraph at Big Bear, um, which is a pretty low site to use a coronagraph, but he was building a reflecting coronagraph, which as far as I know hadn't been tried before. Um, and most coronagraphs are built with, with very carefully selected lenses. Uh, it turns out that lenses scatter less light than mirrors do. And, uh, but Zirin was trying this new technique of a reflecting coronagraph. It never worked out. It never, it never really worked right. Um, shortly after the observatory was finished, an additional telescope was put on top of this big tube, uh, which was a hydrogen alpha telescope, which was designed for training the Skylab astronauts, who, in addition to being uh, in the space station, the Skylab space station in, in the early 70s, were also going to be solar observers, because the Skylab space station had this wonderful a solar observatory attached to it. And so the astronauts had to learn how to observe the sun. Here's a, draw, a diagram of the inside of that telescope. And you can see here's the front end of it with 
this off-axis chrono, the off-axis 16-inch telescope to feed the spectrograph and so forth. Um, now, <clears throat> this was all put in for the first series of instruments. And you know, the, the spectrograph was built in the floor below, and it's in the down tank, which rotates to correct for the rotation of the image. Uh, very quickly, a new instrument was added to this setup, known as the video magnetograph, which allowed for uh, magnetic field measurements to be made. And this not only allowed the magnetic field measurements to be made, but the changes in the magnetic fields during the day could be tracked, which had never been possible before. Because magnetographs before this time had all been based on spectrographs, which took a long time to build up a magnetic field image. <coughs> so here's a picture of the first. This is the same telescope that's in that drawing. This is where it was. This is down at Caltech. Uh, they installed the telescope on the roof of one of the buildings down there to test it out before they brought it to Big Bear. And this is uh, the reason why I picked this picture is that there. Are, it turns out there are very few pictures of this telescope <coughs> that exist. And this is one of them. This is one of the other ones that exists. And this is in, this is at Big Bear in the old dome. And you can see the, the time lapse movie cameras mounted on the back. These are these are being fed by the two inch ten inch refractors. Refractors. There are some images from that telescope. Here's a this is a nice prominence here. And a nice a very famous solar flare from nineteen seventy two. Now in nineteen seventy three all those telescopes are pulled out. Um, you know, Theron was not happy with the off axis chronograph, which never worked. Uh, also, the off axis Cassegrain uh, telescope to see the spectrograph never worked very well either. And he wanted to get something better. And so it turns out that during this time, he had also been involved with this project for uh, building an additional um, solar telescope, that was, which was planned to be flown on the second Skylab space station which, of course, none of you have ever heard of because it never flew. Um, however, the telescope was built, and it ended up at Big Bear. And so this big tank here has, the, uh, has that telescope inside it. Now, of course, that telescope was designed to fly in space, and um, it was built in a vacuum tank with a big window on the front, for use as Big Bear. Now it turns out that putting a solar telescope in a vacuum tank is a really good idea because not only do you have to worry about the sun heating up the ground and causing convection currents in the air above the ground, you also have to worry about the sun heating up the air in the telescope, heating up the mirror in the telescope, heating up the air above the mirror, and it gets convection currents inside the telescope, um, which is just as bad a problem as having, is a worse problem than having them elsewhere. <laughs> and so, by putting the telescope in a big vacuum tank, you avoid that problem. Okay. Um, makes it harder, to, a lot harder to work on the telescope, but um, it does produce better images. Yeah. Question: um, With the hmm? concern about well, the okay, the the internal um, the, actually no, um, the the internal. Uh, geometry of the telescope. It's a, what we call a Gregorian telescope. And so at the bottom of the tank, there's a 26 inch mirror down here, as it was. And it focused the light inside the tank onto this thing called heat stop. Now, of course, when you're moving the telescope onto the sun, um, that beam is not going to be hitting the heat stop necessarily. But it turns out that that beam is also diverging before it hits the, the window. And so, yeah, that was not a problem. Yeah. And so here's another view of that telescope. You have the, the back, this is the back of the tank. You're looking along the side of the telescope. And this is the back of the, of the, of the 10 inch telescope. Now, of course, what happened was that you ended up not only with this 26 inch vacuum telescope, but we also, or Zirin also kept one of the 10 inch telescopes. And, um, the the, uh, the hydrogen alpha full disk telescope, the so-called Singer Link telescope, and he slung those underneath the uh, the vacuum telescope. At the back of the 10-inch telescope, there was a set of flip mirrors to send the light to three different cameras uh, in sequence. 
So the mirrors would flip in and out. And usually you ran with a hydrogen, a hydrogen alpha filter on one side and say a calcium K-line filter on the other side. And those would be run with the stop motion movie cameras. And in the middle of the array was the magnetograph instrument. And here's another view. Um, this is the front end of the 26-inch telescope. And there was this cooling ring mounted on the front. And the idea of that was you could run cool water through here. And that would keep um, the air above the entrance window, which is here, from getting hot. And this was all controlled from this rather big, complicated, scary-looking control panel that was up in the dome with the telescope. Okay. And so this pa I'm not going to explain all the things about this panel, but you have the controls for moving the telescope, you have the controls for controlling the flip mirrors, you have uh, exposure meters for the cameras, um, you have guider amplifiers here, you have the video outputs here. This, was, this picture was from 1991. By then, um, in addition to the film cameras that were being used on most of the filters, there are also time-lapse video cameras that were being used. Um, the reason for that was, well, there were a couple reasons for that. One was that it allowed for the data to be reviewed quickly because you didn't have to wait for it to be processed. And, um, and the other was you could more easily control the time-lapse sequences and so forth, video. The bad part about that was, was that the video was pretty low resolution. Um, <clears throat> of course, the film was much better. But we used a lot of video at that time. But as you can see, the images from the 26-inch telescope under very good atmospheric conditions were, could be quite good. Now, one thing about solar seeing is that even at a site like Big Bear, um, it's extremely rare for conditions to be stable enough to that the atmosphere will be you'll be able to get the full resolution from a telescope of that size. Um, in fact, that hardly ever happens. In general, the best conditions that you'll see at Big Bear um, will allow you to get full resolution, say, from the 10-inch refractors, um, but not from anything larger than that. As we would say, the free parameter is something at best is like 25 centimeters in technical terms. Um, but here's another view. You can see, again, that uh, you get reasonably good uh, images of, this pen of the penumbra of the sunspot. Now, one of our main missions, of course, was to do these time-lapse movies. And so this is an example of one of them. Um, this, is, this was transferred to video many years ago. And, um, so in the background, you can hear the clock running, which, is, which has nothing to do with the video. Um, and so you can see the, the solar flare here. This flare is from 1989, which was um, a peak year of solar activity. That isn't when it was taken. <laughs> and now we've changed wavelengths. So here now we've changed position and we've changed the exposure so that uh, we're looking to we get more of the detail of the, of the active prominence. Anyway, that's the sort of thing that we were getting. Um, so as some of you may remember, in 1992 we had this little earthquake, um, June 28th, and um, the, that caused quite a bit of damage at the observatory. What happened primarily was that the concrete pier that the telescope was mounted on um, split down the middle. And almost, almost, if it had been shaking, I think, for five or ten seconds longer, the whole thing would have come apart, and the telescope would have ended up um, uh, going through the floor. Um, but as it was, the whole pier had to be uh, cut down and replaced. And so the telescope was taken out of the dome and put on a truck and, and put in the garage that we have on shore. And the whole pier was replaced with a new one. And we were out of action for about four months. 
The other thing, another thing that happened that was interesting happened in the 90s was that Big Bear became um, attached to a wider world of solar observing. Um, we were became associated with what's known as the Gong program. Gong telescope is is actually mounted in this um, innocuous looking uh, shipping container that's uh, parked at the shoreline at the observatory. And there's actually a telescope in there that runs automatically and tracks the sun. It turns out that what it's doing is it's uh, observing the solar vibrations. The sun vibrates like a big bell at a very low frequency. Um, normal, normally audible sound is between 20 cycles per second and 20,000 cycles per second. But these solar frequencies, these solar oscillations occurring are, in, are at cycles of anywhere between one cycle every three minutes to one cycle every five minutes or so. And so it vibrates at these very low frequencies. Now, the interesting thing about that is that you can, you can, uh, you can measure how these vibrations are propagating through the interior of the sun which can tell us about the interior structure of the sun in ways that are otherwise completely impossible to do. So the gong instrument allows us to do this. And it does this by having six identical telescopes spaced around the planet so that when the sun goes down in Big Bear, it's still up in, in Hawaii and in Australia and later on in, in India and in the Inner Islands and in Chile. And so as, as the sun, as the Earth rotates, the sun is always looking, shining down on at least one of the Gong telescopes. And the raw data from the Gong telescope look like this. You're seeing all of the, the gas moving up and down in the surface of the sun. And so by splicing out the frequencies spatially and, and temporally of the vibrations in images like this, um, you're able to map the interior of the sun. It's quite a complicated process, and it involves us taking very long sequences of these kinds of images, which is why you need the, the telescopes, so that you're, you're not interrupted by nighttime or by clouds. Four of the telescopes were set up at their various locations. They were all tested to, all together in Tucson, um, a place that they called the Gong Farm because <laughs> they were growing bombs. <laughs> uh, and the sunlight is fed into the telescope through this turret, which tracks the sun automatically, and is, is fed into, this, into a very narrow band uh, filter system here and into the camera system, which is inside this can. Now, in 1997, Professor Zirin uh, retired, and um, at that point, um, Caltech decided that um, that they wanted to concentrate more of their effort on their nighttime program. During this time, the Caltech had not only, you know, they, for all this time they had Palomar, and now they had developed the Keck telescopes in Hawaii, and they were working on all these other uh, nighttime projects, and so they decided that it would be better to concentrate their efforts there and get out of the solar astronomy business. And But they had the good sense to realize that Big Bear was a really good was a really good observatory, and rather than just shutting us down, um, they decided to see if some other institution could be brought in to operate the observatory. And so NJIT had a good solar astronomy group with a number of former Caltech people, and they agreed to take over the operation. And so now the observatory is now operated by NJIT. And so things continued uh, for a number of years after that, gradually replacing the film cameras and the video cameras with digital cameras and uh, improving the instrumentation and replacing the single spectrograph that we had for many years uh, as our single CUDE instrument with a whole CUDE laboratory with uh, optical benches and so forth inside uh, so that a variety of different kinds of instruments could be operated. Fixed location, which is much easier to operate than uh, having the instruments hanging on the telescope. But still, it came down to a question of how viable the telescope was going to remain into the future. People realized by then that space-based observatories were 
were becoming uh, possible and were going to be built. And that once you had, say, a half meter solar telescope in orbit, um, then it would produce perfect images all the time because there's no atmosphere, no atmosphere up there, and there's, so there's no distortion of the image at all. And so, how are we going to keep operating? How are we going to compete with that? So there were there were a couple there were a couple of things that would help us. The first thing is that, of course, being on the ground, um, it's possible to build a big telescope um, without spending a huge amount of money. Um, you know, the Hubble telescope is a two-meter telescope, and <clears throat> it costs like something like a billion dollars or something, and or more than that. And um, of course, it can't be used on the sun, uh, but you could, in principle, build a big telescope like that just for the sun. But there are two things wrong with that. One is that the money was never going to be available. So the solar community just wasn't big enough to push for a project like that. Um, but you could build big telescopes on the ground for relatively little money. Unfortunately, you have to deal with the distortion. But there was a way around that. Um, about 20 years before that, back in the late 70s, early 80s, the Air Force had begun developing this technique called adaptive optics, which basically lets you measure the distortion very rapidly and insert an opposite distortion into the optical path to correct for it. And so by doing that, you could, in principle at least, um, have a perfect solar image no matter what size telescope you had. And so it began to be possible then to think about building a bigger telescope. And to build a bigger telescope, then we could observe at higher resolution than the spacecraft can, and for less money, and keep operating. And so after many years, such a telescope has actually been built. And in 2008, we have installed, um, okay, it says the world's biggest aperture telescope. I'm going to get in a lot of trouble with this. I, I'm not going to go there. Um, anyway, it turns out there is another telescope um, in Arizona, which is about just about the same size as this one. Um, that depends how you look at it. It's slightly smaller, but not enough to matter. Um, but the, the thing is that that telescope has never had really high resolution images because it wasn't built for adaptive optics. It was built many years ago. And it has a lot of internal seeing problems, as well as being on the top of a hot mountain with uh, no lake around it. But anyway, so we have built the, this 1.6 meter solar telescope, which is optimized for high resolution, high resolution imaging and adaptive optics. So in 2003, we began to have the mirror made. This is the parent rating rough ground at the old, what was then Kodak plant in, in New York. The mirror itself is made of a material called zero dur, which is, which is from Germany. And the property of this particular kind of glass is that it changes its shape very little um, with temperature. It's kind of like a super duper pyrex. It, it, so even though it may get warm with the sunlight shining on it, it doesn't change shape, which means the focus doesn't change. And so finally, in 2008, the telescope was installed. We have a new dome now, because the telescope was too big to fit in the old dome. And, and here it is. You notice it has some unusual features for a telescope this size. It has this, this is the, the main part of the structure here. The telescope is pointed this way, up through that hole. But you'll notice that the main mirror at the back is tilted. And this is because it's what's called an off-axis mirror. Instead of having the focus in front of the um, mirror, the way a normal telescope does, it has the focus off to the side, um, which uh, having the focus in front of the primary mirror reduces the contrast. And um, it also makes it harder for the adaptive optics to work. Um, and so in order to prevent those problems, the telescope was built with this off-axis configuration. Now this again was not the first time that such a telescope had been built. Um, you know, William Herschel built off-axis telescopes 200 years ago. Uh, but his telescopes and all off-axis telescopes since then were extremely long focal lengths. 
Um, this telescope has a very short focal length, 2.5 if I remember right. Um, and so for its diameter, it's a very short focal length. And it's extremely off axis. Um, so that in fact, it's, it's, you can think of it as being a section out of a, prime, out of a, a theoretical mirror, an on axis mirror of about this size. Okay. And so it's extremely off axis. And, and grinding, you know, polishing and, and, and figuring such a mirror was a big challenge. And it had never been done before with a mirror this far off axis of this size. The picture of the telescope in the dome. Uh, sometimes we have to do work on the outside of the telescope when we hire a big man lift to do that, and we can take pictures. And then here is what the telescope looks like when it's pointed at the sun. Light is being focused out over here, um, behind this, this bar here, so you can't see it. This is the, actually the primary mirror. Now, the telescope is not just, you know, when we think of the telescope, it's not really right to think of just the telescope as the thing that's up in the top of the dome moving around. The telescope is the whole set of instrumentation. So you have the thing on the top of the dome that's moving around. That's this part up here. And it focuses the light down to the flat mirrors inside here, which send the light down here, down the axis. And down into these laboratories down below, these are the descendants of the coup de spectrograph. Um, this is where all of the, the science cameras are and where the adaptive optics system is located. So we can work on these things down in a fixed laboratory at a fixed temperature, which makes things simpler uh, painting those instruments. Um, but it does require having this complicated optical system to get the light down there. This is what the inside of the laboratory looks like. And it actually works, which is the remarkable thing. So here is, here is the proof of the pudding. Okay? This is, these are two images of, of the same location of the sun at just about exactly the same time, taken with Hinode, which is a spacecraft with a half-meter mirror, very fine instrument in space, and with the NST. So the same scale, you can see the same features here, but in our image, you can see the details that you can't see. And that's the whole reason for doing this. Here's a picture of a sunspot. Nice, ordinary, round sunspot. You can think of this picture, compare it with the one from 1989 from the 26-inch. Um, similar features, but you can see much finer details here that were impossible to see earlier generation television. Can you give an idea of scale? Well, let's see. The features on the outside of the sunspot are called full, and each of these features is roughly the size, say, of California. So you can see that the sunspot, you know, it's bigger than the Earth. So going back to the original purpose of the observatory at Big Bear, which was to make time-lapse movies of the evolution of solar activity, this is what we can do now. Oh, yes. yes. So this is the solar granulation. And when you're seeing, it's like, if you're looking down at, all right, if you can think of a, I mean, this is gas, okay, but think of it, in, if you think of it as like liquid, uh, you can think of it as like a pot of boiling water, okay? You have the heat coming up from the bottom, you have these convective cells coming up to the top and expanding and going back down. Uh, that's what's happening here. And what the interesting thing is are these small features at the edges of the granules, which have not been well observed before. That's something that we're working on. We can also see um, how flux emerges near here. You can see the granulation here, but you'll notice here there's, a, there's kind of this odd-shaped granulation here. And watch the movie. See how things are emerging here, structures appearing, spreading out, tracing the magnetic field structures uh, coming from the top. We can also look at center of hydrogen alpha. This is not a really great movie, but um, this is a, now I should replace this. But I get an idea of what's happening here. It's from a, this is from like 2009. I have better ones now. Well, this, this image, this, it, it's covering about uh, half an hour, I think. And the, so the frame rate is probably about one image every 10 seconds. But this image uh, from 2012, is this is probably uh, one of our more remarkable uh, movies so far. So what we have here again, this is a sunspot. 
And now we're kind of in what we call the wing of the hydrogen alpha line, a bit off of the center of the line, which allows us to see photospheric features pretty well, but also gives us a good view of the spheric features here. Now this is a no time left to see some small solar flares taking place here. So this is what we are working on now, and uh, we're continuing to improve our imaging capability, and we're trying to better understand what's happening in these. In these. Um, a lot of these features are things that um, haven't really been seen before. So understanding exactly what they are is going to take a little time. Well, uh, most of our films, well, all of our movies are black and white because we're all we're, all, we're looking in one particular wavelength. Okay, so we're looking at hydrogen alpha, say, which is a particular color of red. Okay, and so everything is that color. Okay, it turns out that when you have um, a digital camera, that you can get a higher resolution, better performing camera if it's a black and white camera than if it's a color camera. And so since everything is all the same color anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and so a lot of times when you see films uh, that are released for the public, they will be colorized. Okay? And so they will put the color back in later. Okay? Um, but in fact, the original data are black and white like this. So this one? This is at hydrogen alpha, so it's 653... Um, yeah, 600... 656 nanometers, or 65, 63 angstroms. It's a, it's a deep red color. Well, okay. oh, this is 10830? Oh, okay. Well, then it is infrared. Okay. Ah, 10830. Okay, well, 10830 is an interesting line. It's a helium line um, in, in, the, you know, in the infrared. Um, Infrared is good for us because it turns out that the distortion from the atmosphere is less in the infrared, and the adaptive optics works better. So it's not HL. All right, well, that's all I have for today. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Well, the next step in the evolution of the observatory is a new instrument we're building called CIRA. CIRA is an is a infra, infrared spectrograph that's intended to work at wavelengths that are longer than what we've been able to work at before. It will be working in the range between 2 and 5 microns. Um, now, it's, it turns out that there are some interesting solar features in that wavelength range that have only been able to be investigated from a couple of other observatories and not at the resolution that we hope to be able to get. Um, they will enable us to look at uh, details of the layer of the solar atmosphere immediately above the photosphere, what we call the temperature minimum, um, and try to look at some more detail about how the solar atmosphere transforms from being dominated by the motions of the gas to, the, to being dominated by the motions of the magnetic fields. Um, so that there, there are regions at the temperature minimum which are relatively cool, and should show up well in the infrared wavelengths, as well as the chromospheric network and so forth which show up at the hydrogen alpha or calcium kale. So this is an ongoing project at the observatory. We've been working on this instrument for a couple of years now, and it's um, been quite a challenge. Yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. Okay, at this point, I'm not quite sure how that's going to work out yet. Oh, well, that's true. Um, there will be this, this big event that's going to be taking place in Big Bear on, over Memorial Day weekend called the Starlight Festival. And you might have heard about it because it was just talked about in the, in the Grizzly uh, this week where they have gotten permission to close down the Village Drive um, during the event. And what that's going to involve is a large number of um, organizations that are going to be displaying things in the village. And also, uh, we're
going to be scheduling some special tours that are going to be um, done through that uh, Starlight Festival. Um, as uh, you mentioned, the space that we now have in the building, because of all of the expansion of the instruments, is quite tight, and so we're quite limited as to the number of people we can handle um, in tours. But we will be uh, planning to do that. Questions? Yeah. Did you ever run a live feed or something? Well, well, what we do have is that um, on the we may be developing something like that. Uh, in association with the Starlight Festival. I don't know exactly how that's going to work yet, but that is one of the things we're talking about. Um, but what we do have right now on the website is a there is a live H alpha full disk feed. We have a small telescope that's next to the big one. Uh, you might remember that um, on the old telescope we had this full disk hydrogen alpha telescope, uh, which we used for um, flare patrol and for also finding uh, interesting places on the sun to observe. There wasn't any place to put that on the new telescope. What we ended up doing was putting um, a version of that telescope in this small dome that's next to our big one um, on the causeway. And we do have a live feed, a feed from that that updates every minute. Our website is www.bbso.njit edu, which I know sounds kind of long, but if you Google BBSO, you'll find it. And so, yes, well, this is one of this is what one of our full disk images looks like. Still operates Earth We do have another project at the observatory, what we call Earthshine. Earthshine. Um, and what that is, it, we can use a small telescope to measure the amount of light that's reflected from the Earth to the Moon and back. And the purpose of that is not really to study the Moon. The purpose of that is to study the reflectivity of the Earth, which can change depending on the amount of cloud cover and so forth um, from weather systems. Um, and so we're monitoring that Earth shine over time using a second telescope that's actually located in the same dome as the Hydrogen Alpha Telescope. Uh, so during the daytime, we operate the hydrogen alpha telescope, and at nighttime, uh, in the right phase of the moon, we operate the Earthshine telescope. That's the only telescope we have that operates at night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For our, yes. Yeah. It's, oh yes, it's been especially interesting this week because there's been there's a very nice active region on the disk right now. Yeah. We have some limited involvement with that. Had, we've had the, the students um, come to the observatory and uh, and, um, and uh, also to have a small portable telescope and we can show. Yeah. Hmm? We are working on a new display that's going to be at the Discovery Center. Exactly how that's going to work um, is not clear, but certainly one of the things that we would be displaying on that might very well be um, that image. Oh, well, yeah, when, oh, Eric is reminding me that one of the other things we're planning to have on this monitor that will be here at the Discovery Center will be a virtual tour of the observatory, so you'll be able to, exactly how all that's going to work, we're not have yet to be. We're just yeah. in the early phase. Again, in, the, in response to the question about uh, can we set up a live feed, as I said, John wears a lot of hats at the observatory. That sort of thing is on his list, but uh, we keep piling more on top of it. So it's a very limited staff, so please be patient with that. Also, uh, keep in mind there are a couple more uh, um, lectures coming up. The next ones are scheduled until April. Um, John. Uh, 
Jeff Koons Jeff will Koons. be speaking. He's a uh, very well-known astronomer from Hawaii who will be speaking on the Colossus Telescope Project. This is a concept, an extremely uh, large telescope, well larger than any telescope currently uh, in the plan, and uh, how that can be used for uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. A couple of weeks later, we're very fortunate to have John Stenflow, another very well-respected solar astronomer, will be speaking on uh, watch for announcements about that. And again, if you have any interest in the uh, Friends of the Club, for...